welcome. Welcome to this edition of What Matters. I am here today with my co-host, Andrew Blackwood, a.k.a. Coach Drew. Hey, everybody. Thank you for being here once again, Andrew. Always my pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always, Always a, pleasure. a blessing. So we were not here at the end of last month, but we are going to be doing the show that was intended for last month. And our topic of conversation today is grief. That is what we will be talking about. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew, do you have a clinical definition for us about what grief is? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I have that. So there is a difference between grief is a very is very specific and it is connected with the feeling of loss. Now, usually it's the loss of a person, but grief can also be associated with other things like the loss of a job, um, the loss of a relationship where the other person isn't hasn't passed away, but you no longer have that that contact with them. Right. And um, the loss of more situational, you feel that you've lost your place. So there's a grief over a time in your life that 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 sounds good yeah the reason and i was being facetious when i said no only because i use the term quite often okay i don't use it just when somebody dies mm -hmm. i use it when there is a loss of mm -hmm. any kind or you know different people have different experiences so um but in a very technical sense yes grief is associated with the experience of loss mm -hmm. whether it's a person a thing a period of time anything that has some sort of meaning exactly and and that's the important thing too is that the thing that you're grieving over would have to be significant to you to that's you, right. why that's to why you. it is great to exactly. you exactly and that's what makes it so personal exactly so personal so where somebody, um, you know, I was reading, I've been reading a lot. Um, somebody had commented, you know, they, they were in, they, they were grieving the loss of their job. And someone said, well, you can't grieve that. That's a thing. It's not a person. Um, again, what is significant to you? What is important to you? It, so it is a very, very personal thing. And um, as you will see uh, shortly, they do have um, definitions and charts. And just so that you know, Andrew is very anti-chart. <laughs> yes. This I found out. He does not like the quotes and the statistics, and for very good reason. And Andrew explained it to me. I'd like you to explain to the audience why you, you really don't buy into that. Well, more stats than charts, mm -hmm. because they can be used however somebody wants, mm -hmm. right? If they're trying to make a point, then they use a stat. But, you know, for every 10 people that say one thing, who's to say that you interview 10 of the next people, and they say the opposite so thing. Exactly. So I, I think there is use to it, but then it depends on the character and the integrity of the person who's using it. Uh -huh, so yes. that's why I'm I, I'm a little iffy when it comes to just using or, or listening to stats. But I think there is benefit in appreciating a structure, mm -hmm. right? There is a difference between, well, let's put it this way. I think there's great value in having... Uh, a process map yes a, a cognitive process so that we can on one hand prepare ourselves mm -hmm. for something and then walk ourselves through something but knowing something and then knowing something experientially is knowing it cognitively and then knowing it experientially is completely different so one helps the other mm -hmm. but it doesn't trump the other Exactly. And, and everybody's experience, again, as Andrew said, grief is so personal that everyone's experience is different. Now, there are, um, I do wish I remember the, the, uh, the name of the person who originally created the chart, but I'm sure you've heard of the five stages of grief, sometimes seven. I mentioned to Andrew, I found one with 12. He said, wow, I have never seen that. So I, there are different ones, but the basic structure is five. And I found one that I thought was very relevant to me and interesting and in its own dark way a little bit funny and dave if you'd pull that one up um the one with the u curve so the two different types of the the griefs um so i found this the stages of grief and here is where i think they lay out 12 or more and from my own experience quite accurate but as you see from the 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 picture on the right um, that can be your experience where it is not linear. It doesn't start at the beginning and go to the end, but you'll find yourself going from thinking you're at acceptance and then back at anger or thinking, okay, I, I've got this. And you find yourself back 
in denial. So mm-hmm. it is very personal from, for, from person to person. But there is, as Andrew said, a, a very basic chart. And Dave, if you would pull that one up, the um, I think it's the seven I gave you, seven stages of grief? Yes. So um, this is modified from, there he is. What, what is his name? Kubler Ross model. Mm-hmm. So this is the, the basic model of grief. And there were five they've added to, which have the asterisks, shock and testing. But it goes denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And those are the basic categories. And, and what do you think about that, Andrew? Like- you, you see most of those quite often. But like you were saying, I in my work with people, I find that people move from one to the other. It's not a linear process. Mm-hmm. So for me, um, helping people walk through and label what they're experiencing in that moment, in each mm. moment, because sometimes it's layered and they come in quick succession. So being able to be with whatever stage you're at, I think is the primary thing that you want to be able to do. You want to be able to validate your own experience. Um, And sometimes it's helpful to sit in front of somebody and be able to talk that through. Because when you hear it back, then it starts to make sense. Oh, that's what's going on for me. Right. For example, um, a lot of people talk a lot about midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. What do you think is at the core of that? I would think, I think fear. And remember, fear is on that cycle. Fear is definitely on that cycle. But it would be in this topic, right? Grieving your youth. Grief and loss. Loss, yes. Grief and loss. And a lot of times we we think that that is only associated with death again. Um, But it can be any hair. You could grieve the loss of your hair. Oh yes, absolutely. Right? You can grieve the loss of your physique. You can your grieve mobility, the loss of your, your, your youth, your right? So when people kind of feed their experiences, when they feel safe enough to kind of talk about where they're at, then you can say, well, that sounds like this to me. That sounds like that to me, right? So it, it's helpful to, yes, again, have the framework, but more helpful than that is being able to be with whatever you're experiencing and to, to actually on some level normalize that while it might be different for different people at different times it's normal and it's okay it's common right Mm -hmm. um one of the things that we'll probably come back to it but um a lot of people find themselves confused yes confusion is is definitely i think it was labeled in the other chart disorganization um yes that that confusion of not knowing what to do next right right and I, I like to use the term a disorientation mm-hmm. because on some level, you, your, your whole world is different. Absolutely. Your whole world is different. So on the, again, on a cognitive level, you know that somebody is not here anymore. Let's say the loss of somebody. Mm-hmm. But experientially, what we don't realize is when we relate to people over a period of time, they become part of our lives in a particular way. So there's a oneness between us. It's, we, there's an identity that we take on. They're a part of our lives. Right. So even though they're separate people, when somebody dies, part of you dies. dies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Your identity has changed. Part of your world is, is gone. It's not the same. So it's almost like, you know, waking up one morning and up is down. A hundred percent. And down is up. up. You wake up and you're like, no, w- what's going on? And you're so right about that relation. I think that uh, something you hear often, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And and people often realize the value of people and things in their lives once they're absent. Mm-hmm. And even if you're a very present person, you very much try to be in the moment and be very appreciative. And you 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 tell people how you feel about them. From my recent experience, even when you do that, once they're gone, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't enough. And um, for myself, I recently lost, I've suffered several losses, but the most significant is the loss of my son, Darius, is my youngest son's father, who I was very close with as well. And, oh, obviously, he was my youngest son's father. (laughs) But it, it was... 
it reached a point after he was gone, very recently after he was gone, that I started to think I was delusional. And I was like, you know what, Erica? You might be making this bigger in your head than it was. You guys possibly didn't talk that much. Like, it, it, because it was, like you said, it bottomed out. There was just this segment of my life that was just gone. You don't have just, access. You it. don't have access to. And I started looking through our messages. And I was like, yeah, you're not, you're not killing yourself. You spoke to this man every day. Every single day, whether it was a text or it was a phone call, or sometimes we'd only send each other pictures of our son doing something. I'd just send him a snapshot of Darius going down the street, but we communicated every day, and then that was gone. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, it, you have to reorganize yourself, yeah. who you are. Like now, I am no, I I am no longer. Well, I am Dave's son's mom, but. Dave's not here. So it's like you have to fit yourself back in somewhere. And when somebody's that significant, again, they're just gone. It's like it's like a floor in your house suddenly being missing. That, yeah, that's it. That's right? It. Like you, can't, you can't step there. You can't go there. You can't there, walk there anymore. Right? You're on yeah. the main floor. Upstairs is still there. Basement's gone. It's gone. You see the stairs. You open the door. Right. Nothing. Because what happens if you step there? What happens? Oh. Right? You fall. You fall in. You fall in. Grief can be like that. Sometimes you just fall into it. And another um, a great guest that we had on, a friend of Andrew's, um, Dr. Joan, she said it very well that grief is like an ocean. And it comes in waves. And at first, it's so intense. It's, you just, you're being battered. There's no breathing. There's no coming up for air. And you don't know if up is down. Because if you've ever been in the actual ocean and not in a pool, and you get tipped off of the boat, it's very disorienting. Because for a minute, you really don't know what's up, what's down. And it comes so fast. And then it will hit you and it goes back out. And every time it goes back out, you get a bit more time. And sometimes it comes back off time you you weren't expecting it when it does little triggers but it is it is very much like trying to regain your footing right. you know when you get toppled off of that boat so for everybody and and my advice to anyone is honor your grief mm -hmm. honor how you feel it is unique to you um, you and someone else if you have a sibling you can both be grieving the same person and it look completely different and it doesn't mean you're right, and it doesn't mean they're wrong. We just have to honor how we feel and the stages in which we go through it. Um, not not rushing it or trying to go by someone else's timetable, um, because something Andrew and I will discuss in the next segment is how uncomfortable other people's feelings are, um, especially when they're that intense. Uh, grief is heavy. Grief is it's very weighty. And so that is not something that every and anyone wants to help you carry, right. which is which quite honestly is understandable. But you have to know your circle. Um, and one of the things we, we're going to talk about the physical symptoms of it because it's a very much a physical, it manifests physically, right. um, talking about how to cope and also talking about how to help, you know, what, what to say, what not to say, um, how you can really be of value. Um, to somebody that you care about that is grieving. Um, but the one piece of advice I have going out of this segment from my new experience wisdom is it, it happens in your time. You have to take your time. And I think what Andrew said is really significant. Be where you are and speak on it and figure out where on that chart. You may have another word for it, but figure it out. Label what it is you're feeling yep. and it will help you process it better and when we come back from this break we are going to speak about because of course andrew is always helping me out we'll speak about your words and how you say what you say and how significant that is to your healing and the healing of those around you so we'll be right back after this break at benjamin law we understand the real cost of personal injuries as the victim of an accident you may be the one who's physically hurt but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. 
Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity and our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by Remax West. Welcome back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I never know which camera to look at. We which just look at them both. Just look at them both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to need your help, Dave. You just, just so make just me not point. look cross-eyed, point. okay? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about physical symptoms. Being cross-eyed sometimes might even be one. Might <laughs> even be what? Oh, you'd be amazed what happens. You never what know happens? which way to look. You never know who's who and what's what. But one of the most common um, experiences of loss is sadness and depression yes and it makes sense right wait wait hold on what's the difference between sadness and depression so you can be sad and not depressed okay right because sad you know when you're feeling sad there is um in terms of intensity mm -hmm. sadness is probably lower on the intensity okay. scale whereas depression it encompasses can encompass a whole lot of different things so when people are depressed, and not, not even clinically depressed, but when you start to experience depression, there is less energy, mm -hmm. right? There are things like less appetite. Um, your processing is decreased. Um, you are, you're losing interest in some of the things that you want to do and the people that you want to see. You start to isolate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can, um, you're moving on that intensity scale from sadness to depressed and, and on into depression. So, um, and I like to think about depression sometimes as a mood. Okay. And not just, it's not just emotion, but it can be a mood. When you think about a mood, there are several emotions that can be uh, encapsulated in a mood. Right, right? absolutely. You can be depressed and feel angry. Yes, Right. yes. A lot of people are angry and all they see is the anger, but they don't see the depression. depression. And that's often a case a lot with kids, right? They look angry, but really, it's depression. And that depression doesn't have a way to show itself. It's not very, it's latent. It's just, it just holds on to you. Whereas anger, you can activate, you can do something with it. And it feels a lot better to be angry than it does to feel Yes, I, mad is much better than <laughs> right? sad in terms of, you know, because when you're mad, you feel mobilized. You feel like you could do something. Yeah. Where you're sad, right. it makes you feel very, right. like right. you can't do anything. And what you just said about the, the anger in children, I think that's something, those of you out there that have teenagers, or maybe you are a teenager, um, that's something that I think we see a lot where yeah. we think they're just angry right. and, and rude, and, and, rude. Disrespectful and, and not realizing that that child is depressed. Yeah. That's, that's a, a very interesting point, Andrew. That's a really great point. And you, and you can, when you start to think about the life of that teen or that person, you start to connect the dots. You realize, oh, again, it's not just the loss of a person. It might be the loss of a place, a relationship. It might be the loss of, you know, many things. Mm -hmm. So um, the mood of depression can incorporate some of those other emotions as well. So those are things to pay attention to. Those are signs and symptoms to be aware of. Um, and then depression can last for a very, very long time. And that's when we get into the ins and outs of how long is too long? Yes. How much is too yes. much? Right? When does it become unhealthy, right, as opposed to a part of a grieving process? Is there an answer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Again, it's 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 varied by again the situation, mm -hmm. right? How close was this person to you? How involved were they in your life? How many losses did you experience? All those things are taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. But what I use as a measurement of health is one, um, the person's what if they're stuck, if there's no movement on that spectrum from one day to the next for two, three, four, five, six months and they haven't moved, they haven't acknowledged any kind of change, any kind of growth, any kind of happiness, any kind of joy, that's when you know this is really, really problematic. Mm 
Okay. Right? So if when you get stuck in yeah. in one of those phases, we showed you that U chart before where you have, and I thought that was a really good one. It's a lot more specific, but when you find that you haven't gone from um, denial to, and again, this is not a how-to. This is definitely not a how-to. We're not telling you how to grieve. But if you see that it, it's stayed in denial, the person's just stuck in, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, this, and it's been months, and they haven't gone to right. bargaining or fear or anger, we may have a problem. Right. Or if you see that sense of being stuck in various domains of their life. So they... If there are no areas of change, mm -hmm. they're just stuck. Like, for example, if they're unable to go to work right, for months and months, that can be problematic, right? Um, if they're unable to eat, mm -hmm. right? If they're unable to engage with people for months and months and months at a time. Most people, you, they, find their, they find their agency, they find their way back to some sense of normalcy in various areas, whereas one particular area, they might be stuck a little longer, mm -hmm. than, yes. right? So looking for those kinds of signs and variation and change, that's important. Another thing is awareness. Okay. Their own awareness of themselves, where they're at and what's going on for them. If they don't have an awareness of that, that's really problematic. So a question for you, and maybe you out there in the audience as well are wondering this. Can your, can the depression outlast the grief? Meaning that because you were grieving, you became depressed, right? It went from just sad, grief and sadness and feeling to actual depression. Can can grief kind of be a trigger for that and and that's where you're left and you've finished grieving do you understand my question yeah i do i do can can grief kind of trigger depression yeah trigger depression and then now you're depressed and you might not still be grieving that particular situation person loss but it's kind of where it left you. It's like that tide that comes in and it sweeps you up and it leaves you over there on the beach. Mm -hmm. Is is that a possibility or do they fit together? I don't see why not. Okay. I think my perspective, we're so different. We're so varied. I don't see why it couldn't trigger that, something like that for somebody. For the most part, in my experience, when they resolve that grief or they move through that grief, the depression can subside. Sometimes the depression leaves and the grief stays longer mm -hmm. because the grief can come and go with triggers like anniversaries and, you know, you smell something that reminds you, you taste something that reminds you. So that can, you know, um, re, uh, can trigger that experience of grief and maybe shorter periods of depression. But usually the depression goes and the grief is, kind of when the grief is resolved. Okay. And there's, and from what I understand, I mean, grief can, you, you reach a point of acceptance. That's always the last one on the chart. Um, but it never really leaves you. You, you always are sad about that loss. Now, does that, we spoke about different types of loss. Um, there are people, situations, places, and does that, carry through for all of them that you know you will still grieve a job many many years after the fact well i think the hope and the experience of most is that over time those experience those emotions they lose their intensity okay right so to say that you'll always be sad is not true will it always be different yes okay but you can move even beyond acceptance to whether you call appreciation whether you call it evolution whether you call it joy mm -hmm. you know there there is life after death right? right there is life after grieving um and i think it's important that we we kind of at benjamin law we understand the only that hope but also give them the time to to get there to get well. there absolutely and so we started out talking about the physical um symptoms the physical effects of it and as you said um, loss of appetite loss of interest in things and you know these these all will sound very similar to the things you will find them list about depression because right. they they mirror each other very very closely um another one i sleep patterns yes sleep patterns go out the window where either you're sleeping too much or you're not sleeping at all right 
Um, and sometimes there's even the fear of sleep, not right. wanting to go to sleep. Right. Um, that happens as well. Um, there are people that have said that they overeat. Because yeah. a lot of people think that, oh, you're, you're feeling down, you're depressed, you're grieving, you won't eat. Some people overeat because people um, indulge in food sometimes as a comfort measure. Right. So that can happen as well. Now, in terms of um, physical illness, I know that our minds, they obviously control everything, right? So, um, for example, with um, my son, we, we, we're still trying to figure it out. He has to go to the doctor, but um, we noticed hair loss. And I mean, he's nine, so he's not balding like that. But so now is it that you're pulling your hair? Is it that you have a condition? Is it because I know stress can actually make you lose your yes. hair yes, as well. So there there are physical things. I'm sure skin conditions, things like eczema and other things can be triggered right. with with grief. So any physical changes, any um, skin problems, even breathing problems, um, anxiety, if you're asthmatic, um, you may find yourself using your puffers more. And it all, I think, plays into that feeling of helplessness and being unbalanced and, and not being in control. So as Andrew said, I think that importance of speaking to speaking about where you are, how you feel, whether if it's a wonderful support system like I have, or as I was saying to Andrew before the show, I think that for some people who don't have that, it, it hotlines. I mean, even for myself, I found great comfort in speaking to people that I don't really know that right, well. Right. And that's one of the benefits of having organizations like Bereaved Families of Ontario. Um, because it's one thing to connect with somebody who you care about, but if they haven't had an experience of loss or haven't had the ability to kind of, or the opportunity to walk through someone with it, somebody who is there or who has been there, mm -hmm. they have a different vantage point. And they can speak to you. It's just like, you know, you can speak to a medical doctor who's a man about, you know, your female needs and support. He can deliver a baby, but he's not going to understand it like another woman who's delivered a baby, right? Mm -hmm. So there is some, there's value to both, but I think it's important to know what, the, what those organizations are and know to who they can go to um, if they need additional support. Absolutely, and I and and that's been one of the things I've been working on for the last week or two is really seeking out um, counselors and and social workers and and the 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 therapy that is needed for us to be able to go forward. And when we come back, there's there's a few things that I do want to touch on. Um, we've spoken a little bit about how to cope, and um, before we came on, I did speak to Andrew the difference between coping and healing because on this show we talk a lot about healing, right, Andrew. He heals. That's what he does. You learn how to apologize to yourself and to other people, and yes. it will heal. And th I'm not just saying this, but she's, it truly will heal your life. But I think with this, it's more of a coping than a, and a healing. And when we come back from the break, I'll explain that. But we'll also talk about how you can help someone who's going through this process. So we'll be back after this break. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by REMAX West. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. We're going to do that 
<laughs> Welcome back. Oh, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. This is why I'm giggling this way, but I will get it right. You guys will see a little live clip um, of the video. So today I'm here with Andrew L. Blackwood, a.k.a. Coach Drew Can, and you have to check out the amazing things that he is doing on Instagram, on his site, coachdrew.ca, right? That's right, coachdrew.ca. Coach um, you you new to YouTube too. New to, yes, the YouTube channel. You got to like, you got to subscribe. But Please, I, yeah. I, I mean, I follow him on Instagram and I'm t you have to go and check him out. Amazing tips, advice, challenges. I was just asking you about your uh, decluttering. My, my minimalist challenge. Minimalist <laughs> challenge. I caught him on like day two and he's like, each day I'm going to throw out X amount of things. I'm like, I can't wait till day 30. So when I asked him what was left, he said, I said, what did you throw out? He said, what didn't I throw out? <laughs> <laughs> What's and left? There's more. There's more. There's more to go. There's, yes. We as human beings kind of collect things. We do. Yeah, we we do. do. And everybody I know that has started any kind of purging have become purging addicts. And the other people in their house have to hold on to things. They're like, no, Christmas will come again. Please don't throw yeah, out the yeah, tree. Yeah. <laughs> but it is really, it is it is very addictive to, to purge your life of all the extras. And you find out very quickly you have way too much stuff. We have too much stuff. Yeah. We, too much stuff from clothing to... We collect too much stuff, and it weighs us down emotionally. It keeps us trapped. It keeps us in the same place. So that's my little segue. You must check out CoachDrew.ca. He's on Instagram. He's on YouTube. You have to check him out. Real help, and I mean, you're actually getting it for free. So get on those <laughs> those channels and 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 get get the information because it's been wonderful following you on on all of these interesting projects and journeys. It really makes you think. And introspecting is, is is very important. So we're here today, and we're talking about grief. Um, and for myself, I've experienced several losses recently um, of people very close to me. It started in December with the loss of my son's godfather slash uncle. Um, tremendous man, amazing man, and it. It again, this is why it hurts, is because the person has tremendous so impact. So, they were so yeah. good. Um, and then, uh, very sadly, and Dave, if you could pull up the pit, the one with the, the calendar where Dave's at the top and he's pointing and all the football guys are around him. Um, in April, we lost um, Darius's dad. There he is, Dave Spence, Coach Dave. Spence, and um, again, a tremendous, tremendous man. Uh, I, I really wish that I, I could express, because I'm getting a little bit tongue-tied, of what a tremendous man, father, friend Dave was. And um, it's that's one of my favorite pictures in the whole world. That's Dave and our little boy. Um, and he, he was very significant in our lives and he he played a very big role obviously um because he went above and beyond he went above and beyond in everything that he did and so the loss has been great and you were saying we were talking right before the break about speaking to people and sometimes speaking to strangers um can be very helpful and <clears throat> what I'm realizing through this process, because obviously I'd, I'm not grieving alone. Um, he was brother, son, uncle, many things to many people. And sometimes it seems to be helpful to grieve with people that are grieving about the same person. And other times it... Not so much. Not so much. It almost feels sometimes that we're pulling each other into the, the quicksand. So it can be helpful because you understand to to some degree what the other person's lost because we are different to everyone in our life That's right. you are andrew blackwood but you are different to me as you are different to dave as you are different to your everybody you play a different role right. we have different relationships we have different relationships so it's never exactly the same even if it's siblings talking about the loss of a parent it's never exactly the same but there's that shared experience you know you can reminisce over certain things their laugh their smile but I've also found at times that it's just too heavy. We, we are all too much for each other. Um, and how do you, and then there becomes the danger of pushing a 
away the people who need you. Yeah, we were talking about uh, how do you cope? Yes, coping, yes. How coping do you cope? is often about finding a balance, right? Sometimes you do want to be close. Sometimes you want to be alone, right? Too much of anything cannot be helpful eventually. And I think that's part of the difference between coping and change. Coping is temporary. Mm. Change okay. is what leads to healing and that's long lasting and that's that's going to keep growing and growing but when we get stuck with our coping strategies then after a while they're not so helpful very that was amazing i see i i don't know i'm gonna have to ask can i clap on my own show <laughs> can I, I start <laughs> clapping for andrew because that was amazing because before the show started that's something i said to andrew that this is not one of those situations where i think um because we always talk about healing, how to heal yourself. Because that's really what you want to do. You want to look inside, th think about why you're thinking what you're thinking. That's my big thing. Mm -hmm. And and work on why you're thinking it and learn new skills and learn new ways and to heal yourself and heal the relationships around you. But in grief, and Andrew will correct me if I'm going down the wrong path, initially I don't think that it's, about healing. I think the healing comes with time. It's not something you can control because as you said, you have your coping strategies to get to the end of the day. And I remember at the very, very beginning, that's what it was for me. The goal was to get to the end of today. To remember to breathe. That was, right? yes. Actually, at the very beginning, that's what happened. Yes. Um, I've, I've had phone calls where I, the first thing I was told was, okay, you're going to need to breathe because you're not breathing. You're hyper, you know, almost to the point of hyperventilating ventilating right. but right you have to remember to do simple things like breathe breathe and eat eat and reacquaint yourself with a sleep pattern right because for the initial phases sometimes you cope by changing the routine completely taking time off work right right do you never go back to work again right. no you cope you give yourself time and it's not just time but it's what you do in that time right it's what you do with that time that really either lengthens that progress of transitioning from coping to change or it shortens it. And that's the beauty of having help. Yes. Right? When you're alone with this stuff, it's you're going to stick with coping a lot longer and you're just going to be trying to survive. Whereas if you have help to walk this thing through, because life doesn't stop, especially it's if you're so a parent. It's so rude. Right? It doesn't stop. It's so it rude. <laughs> I thought that, that the world was very audacious for continuing on. To go as if. As if. How yeah. the mall was open. Yeah. They called me about my bills. Yeah. I thought it was ridiculous that everything just kept going. But you're right. The world does not stop. It doesn't stop. So you may have to pause yourself. Yeah. Pause. Yeah. Yeah. But don't stop. Right. Some things you stop. Some things you pause. But then you regroup and you redefine and you reestablish life. Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier, and it for me, it's so relevant in every area of our life, but when we experience life traumas and challenges and changes, that's when it's really helpful to connect with somebody to help you to pay attention to your patterned thoughts, your, your thought patterns, mm -hmm. the way that you speak about your life, about the situation that informs, it's both indicative of what you think, but it also informs and contributes and reinforces what you think. And that then fuels what you feel, and then that connects to how you live. So an example would be, you know, we were talking about experiencing several losses, one after the other, one after the other. Mm -hmm. And um, people would say, you know, I feel like I feel like everybody's dying. Yes, everybody's dying. And while I get it, it's really it's really easy to roll that into. Everybody's dying. Mm -hmm. I'm going to die. Oh, yeah. It's slippery slope. Everybody's dying. Right. And while on the one hand there's some truth to that, on the other hand, you can see where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. People could be afraid to re-engage with life. What's the point? What's oh. the point in doing this? Everybody's going to die. I'm going to die anyways. Yes. And then you move further and further away from that process of re-engaging with life and and appropriating the beliefs and teasing them apart. So how do we do that? There's a difference between saying, I believe everybody's dying, 
mm -hmm. and saying, you know what, I've lost a lot of people. Yes. I know everybody's not dying, but I've, I've lost, lost a lot of I've people. lost too many people. I've lost too many people in too short of a time, but it, you're absolutely right in that. And we spoke about, because you see, I'm starting to remember the different episodes. Andrew spoke about this in greater detail during our journaling episode. Mm -hmm. And um, I could even put the link in the comments for this video there so you can go back to it. But that language on, on how we say it, and that is something that speaking to other people out loud is so important, especially speaking to intelligent people. <laughs> because you make, they... it, you make it sound like you're not intelligent. <laughs> I, you know what? I am very smart. I will give myself that. But in moments of great distress, yes. you will suspend that in... What you know and what, what you feel will override what you know, mm. right? What you feel will override your logic, your understanding, your reasoning. And that's what happens when you're emotional. And that's why you reach out. You have lifelines. And that's why you label what you feel. Because if you don't validate it for yourself and then start to, for example, I feel hopeless. Okay, What is that hopelessness connected to? It's connected to, I can't change this. I can't control that. And when you start to realize, okay, there are some things that you can't control. The hopelessness makes sense. But then it starts to dissipate because you realize there are some things that you can, can control. control. But if you don't label that hopelessness and you just say, I just feel like there's no point. I just feel like there's no point. You're going to reason with your emotions, emotional reasoning. I just feel like there's no point. And then what do you do? With that hopelessness, you give up. You give up. I think that goes from I feel there is no point to there is no point, right? It goes from what you feel. I've, I've had a big debate recently on the fact that um, someone's reality is what they think, right? And the argument is, well, that's not reality. That's what you think. But what we think becomes our reality. It often does. It often does. It can. So by those re repetitious thoughts, I feel hope. There's no point. Everyone's that you will it will really feel that way and you won't step out and i think that was so helpful for myself and i hope for you out there as well that you cope to get to the point of being able to make changes um as i've said to my son several times i said we're not going to be okay we're going to be fabulous we're going to be wonderful the idea is not just to get back to a point of just being okay you know, we're getting to the end of each day because initially that's really what we had to do. And it was really like a high five situation. Woohoo, it's 9 p.m. Thank goodness <laughs> we're going to bed now. Yeah. You know, we made it through the day. We will start again tomorrow. And you look at each other like, well, what's tomorrow going to bring? But we'll do that then. Let We got through today. But eventually you want to go past getting through today. And you want to, as you said, start to reconnect with life reconnect with and again we're not just speaking of the loss of people but of situations jobs the things that we love the things that identify us because as you said one of the big things about grief is that there's something missing from your life that identified you that was a part of who you actually are yeah. and that can be a job that can be a location. There are people who leave where they've lived and, you know, some people, they move all the time. What's the big deal? It's not the same for everyone. Right. You know, they will grieve their hometown and that life they had there for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and compare everything in their life to it, that it's not the same. Um, so it really is about... The coping, and that's what I had said to Andrew before the show, is that I think with grief that it really is time. But there are intentional, effective things that you can do right. every day to get you through the time to help you cope. And one of them is talking to people. You right. have to talk. And talking to people like Erica, who is so closely connected to the people that she serves. And that's about purpose. Yes. Even during loss, when you are connecting to your purpose and you're living that, that helps you to live. 
exactly. right? It gives you reason. It, you know, that loss can even propel you further and, and deeper into your own purpose. Right? It, it, and using that as fuel yeah. to, to, you know, to, to finding, okay, why am I here? Because I think that's one of the things the people who are left behind have to do is you figure out it, when the person is so significant to you, they made up such a huge part of your life. What is my purpose? What is the point? And sometimes you, that is exactly where you will find more purpose or your purpose is in that loss and honoring that loss. Because Andrew said something before that I thought was very profound in that on all of the charts, it ends at acceptance, that you've now accepted this loss and you know you're going to move on. But as Andrew said, it goes beyond acceptance. You know, it can go into celebration. It can go into the, the memorializing of someone in, in a positive way, not putting them in a shrine, but highlighting their life and expanding on their Legacy, work. Right? Legacy, yeah. exactly. And that's, that is something that we as a family are, are looking to do. I mean, a lot of us are stuck. A lot of us are, are, and I don't know if stuck is even valid. We are where we are. We're going through the process. It's so recent. It's, it's so, so fresh. recent. I think that's part of honoring, though. Like, like you were talking about the ocean, sometimes it can be overwhelming, but eventually it becomes more like the tide, and you're walking on the beach. You don't control when the tide comes in or no, when it don't. goes out, but when it comes in, you acknowledge it, and you, whether you acknowledge it with tears or grieving or whatever it is, it comes, you honor, because that part, Dave mattered. Exactly. Like, oh, he mattered. He made a difference. Huge. So to not acknowledge that, that would be dishonoring him. Yes. And, right? and some people miss out on honoring the people that they've lost because they're so afraid that they're going to get consumed and overwhelmed and not come back up for air. Right? Yeah. So it's good to connect so that we can honor people and move on and keep walking and right? keep walking and and honor them so when we come back from the break we are going to talk a little bit about what you can do to help someone in your life that is grieving and um we'll also talk a little bit about the fun things that people will say to you um that they, they and they obviously honestly think they're being helpful right. please feel free to comment write it in give us a call i'm sure that we've all heard some wonderful Caribbean um, phrase that was given to you in order to console you that might have made you want to throw something. So we will be back after this break. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity and our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by Remax West. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Welcome back to this edition of What Matters. Thank you for joining us. I am here with my co-host, Andrew Blackwood, hey, a.k.a. Coach Drew, check him out on coachdrew.ca. So much to learn, so much to share. And today we are talking about grief. And through the course of the show, as always when I'm with Andrew, I learn so much. And I learned that coping needs to evolve into change. Because yes, at first when we grieve, we have to cope just to get to the end of the day. But if we remain in that coping state, 
we get stuck and we stay stuck. Right. So we need to move towards change. And at first that's not easy, but with one of the things that we said really helps to cope and to, to start that process of change is talking to someone. And between your loved ones, those who are sympathetic to, to what you're going through, um, to professional help. And that's something I highly, highly recommend is to seek therapy. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I've been able to, to, to get some therapy and it's helped enormously and I've just started. Um, and I'm also happy to say that I can see that there are people in my life that are kind of, I'm their litmus test. They're like, oh, you're, you're going to go to see somebody? Okay, let, let me know how that turns out. You know, because they think I'm smart and they think that I'm pretty balanced. So they're like, oh, if you you're going to see right, somebody, right. Then, then it must be, okay, let me know how that works out. So I'm hoping with my own actions to encourage people who are a lot more skeptical, a lot more, oh, I don't know if anybody can help me, to, to give it a try because it makes all the difference in the world when you speak to someone who's trained to hear the words that you're speaking and also to, very importantly, what you're not saying. That helps tremendously. And as Andrew had also said, there are organizations, there are lines, there are hotlines that you can call at to, to, to put your thoughts out. Because sometimes that is really what, you hear what you're thinking. You know, a lot of great therapists, they listen to you. And you hear yourself, you're like, wait. Or they'll repeat back what you said. They literally repeat back your words. And you're like, I said that? I said it's that? Like, that's, what was, yeah. that's what I just said? And it's like, yeah, just just now. Four seconds ago, you said that. So it, it shines a light where you need it. And there's something else that happens when somebody listens well. And there's... There's a process and experience of validation. Yes. A lot of the times people think, I'm crazy. I'm going mm -hmm. crazy. Yes. Yes. And it's not 100%. until they hear themselves and somebody kind of repeats it back to them. They're like, okay, I'm not crazy. But then there's also the experience of learning to tolerate what it is that you label. Mm. Like, because when we label stuff, we experience it again on some level. Right. And it's like going to the gym and you're lifting weights. So every time you mention that loss, right, sometimes you can you can use that to gain strength. You can build your tolerance for that, whatever it is, that sadness or that anxiety. And that way you avoid it becoming complex grief, right? It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just a big ball of yarn because nothing has been teased apart or looked at, right? Absolutely. And um, I, we didn't go over that, and we're not going to go into it too deeply, but they, they do talk about different types of grief as well, and that is one of them, a complex, complicated grief, um, delayed grief, chronic grief. There's, there's all different kinds, but I think to avoid it becoming complicated, you do have to almost, and, and it's funny to say because you're, you, you sit with your <coughs> grief, you live with your grief, but you have to sit with it. And you have to, like you said, in, in order to honor the person, honor your feelings and be, develop that tolerance because you don't want to run from your feelings. You don't want to run, like every time you think of the person, you have to do something else. Right. And that's where some destructive habits can come into play. So, you, you know, you really want to be careful with that. But we, we now as people, we want, <laughs> we want to, um, you know, we want to help. We want to help people. And, and sometimes our way of helping is, is not, not always so helpful. It's not always so helpful. And one of the things, and I'm sure that anyone who's experienced loss or being upset, especially when it is in the public eye, has been told, usually by someone older, stop crying. Mm -hmm. Stop crying is not helpful. You're, you're still dealing with that? <laughs> Jeez, come on, man. Come on, man. It's a long right? time. Yeah, like, get over it is what you're hearing. Essentially, yeah. That is what you're hearing. So looking at someone, especially during funeral proceedings, and telling them to stop crying is not helpful. It's surprising to know that somebody would say that so soon after. No, but, at the gravesite. Yeah. <laughs> stop it, crying. It happens. It happens. It happens 100%. Another one um, that I, and I know this is said with the best of intentions, when people tell you things like, oh, well, they lived a full life. I know it's meant to, to comfort you, to tell you, you know, this, this, 
you should be okay with it because the person did get 80 right. odd years. But at that time, it's not comforting. It doesn't feel comforting. It almost feels like you're minimizing the person's pain. And I think that is actually the intention. You want it to be smaller, but it almost makes it feel like you're being irrational. Yeah, at the very least, unfair. And the assumption is that whatever it is that you want to say, the person is going to want to hear or benefit from hearing whether they want to hear it or not. <laughs> I like that but, one. <laughs> we got to get a clip of that one, the, Dave. I love that one. The, 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 the point, I think, is um, sometimes people do it because they're trying to be helpful mm -hmm. to the other person, but sometimes they're not unwittingly trying to be helpful to themselves because they're uncomfortable with yes. your pain. They're uncomfortable yes. with their own pain. Yes. Right? So they want to push people through it faster. Yeah, like yeah. hurry up and be done with that. And and that is something that you will discover um, when you do go through anything very heavy is that it sorrow is heavy. It's it's like a big wet wool blanket. Mm -hmm. It is heavy and it's uncomfortable. If you've ever wet wool, you'll know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And as much as someone may care about you and love you, other people's feelings are uncomfortable. They are. Um, even to the best of us, the most open of us, other people's feelings can be very uncomfortable. And they want you, well, for want of a better way to put it, they just want you to stop it. They want you to stop all of that emotional they outpouring. To be good. They want you to be back to normal. They want you to be healthy. Yes. They want, they want themselves to be good and normal, normal and back and, and healthy. And I have a friend who experienced a loss about two years ago. It was her mom. And she shared this story with me, which so ironically, I ended up seeing in my own life where she went back to work and, you know, she was called in by a supervisor and they said to her, you know, some of your coworkers are saying, you know, you're not making them laugh like you used to. Well, um, being of Jamaican descent, the rest of this was very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of this conversation was very, very colorful and, and just vibrant in words and language. But um, she basically said, is that my job? Am I like the office clown? I did not know I was hired for other people's amusement. Is there a problem with my work? No. But, you know, other people are saying, you know, you used to come in and make people laugh. You're really lighthearted. And that's when she took more time off because she realized that she wasn't being given the space to grieve that she needed, even though, like you were saying, you continue, right? You you start to do things to bring you back to that point of normalcy, but realizing that her feelings were too heavy for the people around her to deal with. So she took more time off to deal with those feelings. Not everybody in your life and not only wants to, but to a certain degree, it's not their job to, per se. You know, being being role. fair, yeah. it's not their role. That's that's more fair. It's not their role. So I think that and knowing... they might not be equipped, right? Which is partly why we wouldn't want them in that role anyway. Yes, exactly. Right. They're not equipped to deal with it, so you, you don't want them there. But you do get a lot of minimizing. And as Andrew said, I really do believe that's other people wanting to be comfortable again. They want things to go back to normal. They want you to go back to normal. They want you to be the person they knew before this happened and it does take time and I think that something really important is even though you're in a, in a high emotional state one of the things I've done from a lot of things is step back right I've stepped back in situations where I might have become angry or upset I step back because I know one my reactions may be much stronger than they would be under regular circumstances and also two other people are trying to deal with this altered you. Mm -hmm. So I think in fairness, sometimes it's very important to step away right. from the offender who's not trying to offend most time. I'd say nine and a half times out of 10, there's no malice intended. They aren't trying to be hurtful. Right. And there's some truth to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. It's just the timing that's really yeah. off. And one of the things that you taught me, wonderful Erica, um, there are so many things that we can do, but then when we try to do some things that aren't so helpful, one of the things that I know I've done in the past is I've said, you know, anything that I can do, please let Don't me do know. Don't do that. Don't do and that. And Erica highlighted for me. Don't do that. That's not so helpful. 
No. And when you think about it, it's it's logical. They're not going to know what it is, first of all, that you can do. Right. Or that they're going to need in this place of disorientation. So what Erica said to me is just like, if there's something that you want to do or you're able to do, Speak. identify that. Offer it. 100%. And beautiful. And, and Dave, we are going to wrap up because I see our time is almost up. But that would be, and I'm so glad. See, Andrew remembers things, and this is why he's such a good co-host. Um, that is something I said to him early in. I've had a lot of offers, a lot of, you know, messages. And, for, Erica, you know, if you need anything, just let me know. Um, what are you offering? Are you going to say a prayer for me? Um, can you come pick my son up? Can you pay for this year's day camp? What is it that you're, are you going to bring him to an activity with you? What are you offering? One, I don't want to overstep by asking for something you weren't offering. Right. And what people tend to do is they just don't ask. And I would seen, seen that and one of the things not to do for people is say things like, you know, call me anytime because you're putting it back on the person. You know, set timers in your phone. That's another wonderful tip that I have for you. Five weeks after, eight weeks after, because you know what? Some of the loneliest times are after, after. Everyone's there for the funeral. Everyone's there when you just lost your job. You just moved to another city. You get the cakes and the, <clears throat> the baked goods and so forth. And, you know, three weeks later, you're starving. Or three weeks later, you'd really like to hear a friendly voice. So space out that that connection, that reconnecting, that checking in, space it out, not just the week after, but weeks after when the person, a year after, a year a after year a six half, months years after, years two after. years, how are you? How are you doing? And when you make an offer of help, know what it is you're offering that you're truly willing to give because it will be very hurtful for that person to reach out for the help that you offered and you're like, no, not that. So be clear in what it is that you can you can offer and you're willing to do for the person. And be sincere as well. One of the most helpful things I've heard over the last two months is, I don't know what to say. Right. Honestly, that has been one of the most helpful, because I know you care and you want to say something, but you don't know what it is, so you're just honest and you're like, I don't know what to say, so right. I'm just going to, I'm here. Because sometimes there are no words and that's, joining you in that experience of you not knowing what to say so either, either. So yeah i don't nobody know what to, knows say. What to say we're okay we're okay let's anything. just not say anything so that those are some of my tips on how you and thank you andrew for bringing it up because that that is a very big one know what you're offering and 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 be honest when you don't know what to do or you don't know what to say and i'm so sorry i don't know what to say that that really is okay because it's honest and it's true and you know what often the person grieving doesn't know what to say either so I thank you, Andrew. I thank you for, for this, this session, um, the healing that comes from this. I thank my TCN family, Dave behind the wheels of steel over there, getting it done. Thank you so much. And I, I thank the station for being so patient and kind and loving. And, and my viewers, my, as they say, my friends, fans, and followers, I thank you for all of your support. And I, I sincerely hope that whatever I learn through this, I can share with you. I can help ease someone else's pain. I can make it better for someone in any way, even if it's now that I know about the Ontario Bereavement Services. Maybe I can direct you there. So I thank you. I will be back next week and looking forward towards change and not just coping. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks. Bye for now. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. 
Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by REMAX West.